Every couple of months or so, GMT comes out with a game that creates a huge buzz around it and actually manages to reach also gamers outside of the strict, small and self-defined world of wargaming. Uh, it happened a couple of months ago with um, Labyrinth the War on Terror and it is happening now with Fighting Formations Cross Toilet Motorized Infantry Division which is a game designed by the same designer who created Combat Commander and because of that, since that was a game that managed in fact to uh, sort of bridge the gap between war gamers and non war gamers, then this is also a game that is attracting a lot of attention again outside of the world of war gaming. It is a game that follows the evolution of a German division during World War II and there are 10 scenarios that will allow you to follow that evolution. Also, incidentally, they create 10 very interesting battles and they're pretty different from one another, so great replay value there. Um, it's a game that introduces a couple of extremely interesting, innovative and refreshing concepts. I can already tell that I like this game a lot, so big spoiler here, but well, let's take a look at the game now. By far the most important and the most innovative element in the game is the order matrix which is here and is printed on a track display. The order matrix is divided in 10 bands and it has an order written on each side of each band. One side of the matrix is used by the German player and one other side is used by the Russian player. In fact, in order to perform actions, the players need to remove a cube for, from the matrix and then they will be allowed to perform the corresponding order or any order listed below it on the uh, order matrix. For example, if I'm the German player, I remove that cube, then I can perform the sniper action or any of these other actions here. If I am the same, the, the Russian Soviet player, I remove this same cube, then I can perform the assault action or any actions below the assault. Each time a cube is removed from the order matrix, the corresponding price in terms of initiative needs to be paid, and that price is recorded here on the initiative track. When you remove a cube, you move the initiative pawn um, a certain number of spaces in the direction of your opponent's track. For example, if I'm the German player, I removed the cube that was on the seven band of the order matrix, then now I need to move the initiative pawn by seven spaces, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, towards the Soviet side of the initiative track. And this is of immense importance because the turn is not divided in a standard sequence of I go, you go, but the player whose initiative is, the player that retains the initiative by having the pawn on his side of the initiative track, can keep performing actions until the pawn reaches the other half of the initiative track. For example, now it would be the turn for the Soviet player to act because the pawn is on the Soviet side of the initiative track. Then suppose that the Soviet player decides to play an asset, which is to play an action card. Then he removes this cube, he pays the corresponding cost, which is one. After that action is resolved, the initiative pawn is still on the Soviet side of the matrix of the initiative track. So now the Soviet player can perform another action, suppose he decides to move his units, then the pawn moves like that. I could probably spend the rest of this review just telling about the order matrix and all the interesting implications and game, game effects that it has. For example, as you can see, the same orders are not necessarily written in the same band of the order matrix. For example, Assault would cost 5 points of initiative to the German player, but would cost seven for the Soviet player. That means certain actions are more complex and more expensive for certain players. And in other games, probably in order to model this, you would have an entire set of rules, sub rules, exceptions. Oh, I have to give my the modifier for the Soviet player. Oh, but there is another type of modifier when the German player is executing such and such action. Not here. The order matrix keeps it all together, it's all there, it's all visible and it's all, it's all so economically presented that it really allows you to concentrate on the action of, on the board and to see the flow of the action rather than spending most of your time just browsing the rule book to look for that small exception that you are afraid you are forgetting. After spending the initiative necessary to remove the cube from the order matrix, the players may need to pay additional initiative costs 
based on the situation on the board. In fact, the players will have a certain number of these command tokens, um, and each command token has a side with a zero written on, and another side with a one written on. Um, once they or issue an order, they can place one of these command tokens anywhere on the board. Actually, they can place them at any time during the game, but usually you do it before you execute an action. Each command token has a certain range, and the scenario will tell you uh, what is the range. Suppose in this case that the range is two, so every Russian unit which is within two axes will be in command will be brought by command under this mission command token here and there is a zero side up that means that after I spend the, the price for removing the cube I can execute the order corresponding to the cube without paying any extra uh, initiative as long as the units are being activated by this command marker here for example these units would be able so suppose that the order was moving, I, I pay the price for moving and then I can move all of these units uh, for zero extra initiative just because they are being moved by that uh, command token. And I can perform any order uh, this turn with these units without spending any extra initiative precisely because the command token is with the zero side uh, face up. At the end of the turn, whoever had to flip this marker, and that means the next turn, units that are being activated by that command token will have to spend one extra point of initiative. Suppose I decide to move this group of units here, then I spend the usual price to remove the cube, and then I had to spend four extra initiative points, one per um, unit that has been activated by that uh, command marker. Also at the end of the turn in which the command marker is with the one side face up, the, the command marker is removed and we'll enter the game later. So in the meanwhile I have to use other markers or just wait for it. In fact at any time you can actually move units that are not being activated by any command marker. The problem is that each time you activate one of these units to perform an order so suppose I decide to move this unit here, then you have to spend two points of initiative per unit. So that is extremely expensive and really should be avoided at all costs. Other actions that you will take include basic movement, which allows you to move any and all of the units on the board, depending on how much initiative you want to spend, and basic fire, which again allows you to fire with all of your units if you want to spend that much initiative. And then you have variations on those two basic orders. For example, you have assault, which allows you to move your units at half speed and still attack, but with a penalty or advance, which allows you to move your units by only 1x, but in that case they are moving very carefully and they do not draw opportunity fire. When you are doing fire combat, the first thing that you do is to determine the size of the dice that you will be using. The game comes with 5 types of dice, 6, 8, 10, 12 and 20 sided dice. A firing unit will usually use 10 sided dice, however the size of the dice will be modified based on several factors. For example, at close range you have a plus one class of dice. If the range is long or extreme then you lower the class of dice. There are then other things, for example, if the unit is moving during an assault then you also lower the class of dice by one. After determining the dice that are going to be used in that combat, you determine hindrance. Each attack has a basic hindrance number of 1. The number can become higher if the attack passes through an X which has a higher hindrance value. Hindrance just means that the terrain in the X degrades the line of sight, making, making it worse without exactly stopping it. For example, if this unit is attacking this other unit here, the hindrance will be 2 because 2 is the hindrance value of rough terrain. Uh, you have to keep in mind the hindrance value when you are rolling for attack, this unit rolls 2d10 because if any of the numbers that are rolled are equal, is equal or lower than the hindrance value, then the attack is an automatic miss. In this case, oops, it would be a miss, the, the shot just gets lost in the hindrance, otherwise if it is higher than that, uh, the attack actually reaches the X. It does not necessarily mean that it hits the target, but at least it reaches the destination. 
once you have the number and suppose again the attack hasn't been stopped by the hindrance you finally add together the number that you rolled in this case would be a 12 with the combat factor that you're using this unit would use this number here the one with the white background when attacking infantry and this other number here the one with the black background when attacking armor in this case would be 12 and 12 24 that is the total attack value at that point the defender will roll two ten-sided dice the defender always rolls ten-sided dice and we let the result to the defense value which is this number here at the bottom right corner of the unit in this case for example what do we have 16 and 12 is oh that's a hard one 28 yes if the defense value is the same or higher than the attack value then nothing happens if the defender actually gets a lower number so the total of the defender is lower than the total of the attacker then the defender takes a hit the fact that you can influence when your opponent is going to take his turn is great but there are even more interesting decisions to be made during the game and especially there are even decisions to be made during your opponent's turn and those are uh, whether or not you're going to use opportunity fire and or return fire opportunity fire you use when your opponent spends movement points to move his units then for every movement point that is spent any and all of your units can fire at that moving unit by however spending the necessary initiative cost to activate those units so actually if now the Soviet player is uh, opportunity firing against that moving unit to fire with both of these units the Soviet player will need to spend two points of initiative if this was the situation both units would be able to fire for free if those two units are out of command then those units could perform opportunity fire but it would cost a pretty huge amount of four initiative points to do so the other option is after an enemy unit has performed a fire order then you can perform a return fire with one of your units only one not everybody for example this German unit has just fired at this unit here then any one of these units not necessarily the one that was fired at can return fire and fire normally at the firing unit by again spending the usual uh, amount of initiative this unit may return fire by spending two or by spending zero or by spending one if this is the situation on the board this game is exceptionally good and i think really because it gravitates around this amazing idea of the order matrix and the order cubes which at first looks extremely abstract extremely game it clearly is designed for a fact at the beginning maybe you'll be like what is this really supposed to be modeling what, what does this represent and then you really start feeling that that command system becomes part of the action it is again it's it's interrelated with the action at all times you don't feel like oh no I'm moving people on the board and now I'm doing this other mathematical thing there they do both sides the command and the execution of the commands become two sides of the same coin in an extremely effective and smooth way the flow of the action is continuous a lot the fact that you always have to make decisions you can play during your your opponent's turn by doing opportunity fire or return fire uh, there's just so many things to do at all times i like the combat system yes there are a lot of dice to be rolled and some people may feel that maybe some of these are unnecessary because both the uh, attacker and the defender roll dice in many games only the attacker rolls but again actually i don't feel that is a problem i like the fact that again i'm there in a certain way when i'm defending i feel that it's still my responsibility to roll well i'm still uh, there to me this is one of the most exciting and riveting tactical games i played in a long time i don't think that this review can give you not even you know, i can even start to give you a sense of how interesting and exciting this game is so i really hope that you'll try it for yourself for me, personally, I can just tell you that I find this one of the very best war games of 2011.